Hey guys. Um, cool, yeah. Thanks for waiting. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I guess to shortly introduce myself, my name is Ted Shao. I'm a senior research engineer at the Google Brain team. Um, I've been on working on robotics now for the past five years. I've touched upon a few topics, including multitask learning, uh, reinforcement learning, and then lately just broadly thinking about how we can scale robots um, to make sure that they can actually work in the wild, in the real world. Uh, I guess today I'll be talking about quite a few different topics, but as a first preface, uh, I guess um, the first thing to know is that our team is pretty massive now. Uh, all of these projects are huge collaborations with uh, some projects have more than 40 people working on these for many years. So these are large efforts and I'm just very fortunate to call myself to be on teams of very smart people. And secondly, uh, some of my takes are spicier or more controversial than others. And so all of those opinions are definitely only my own and don't reflect those of Google or anyone else on the team. Um, so with that out of the way, yeah, welcome to my TEDx talk. <laughs> Um, so I think maybe some of you have seen, uh, you know, a lot of the cool robot videos, uh, learning videos out in the wild these days, but I am more excited than ever. And it's not just hype. I think, I think there's been a fundamental shift in how researcher and robotics view learning over the past two years. And I think the shift has a lot to do with all of the trends happening more broadly in foundation modeling in large scale internet models um, across different fields like language, audio, and so on. But I think my goal today is to convey to you why I am particularly excited about this time today, right and now, and why there's been a very fundamental 180 degree paradigm shift, I think, across the robot learning field. And if you walk away from this talk with just one thing, and that's you're slightly a bit more excited about robotics than you were before, or believe that the time is now for these robots to really start scaling exponentially and doing something really cool, I think then my talk will have succeeded. Um, let's see. The talk will have a few parts. We're gonna start at a very high level and just talk about why a foundation model for, foundation model for robotics at all, what that might look like and the ingredients and recipe for how we might get there. Then we'll dive into a few different works um, pretty deeply that my team has been very proud of over the past year or two. And finally, we'll go back to the high level and then zoom out and think about what's next for robot learning. So why a foundation model for robotics? So just one sec, let me try to hide this thing. Um, no, that's, that's fine. I will keep that bar there for now. But the top bar says, why foundation model for robotics? Um, you know, being coined here at Stanford, and I'll use the phrases internet scale model, foundation model, and large language model pretty interchangeably throughout, and I hope it's pretty clear. But generally, when I'm talking about these big monolithic beasts that are training on tons of data, they have two very important properties that I think are quite nice. One is emergence. Um, when very simple things kind of work at a small scale, they get a ton better when you just scale things up, more data, more compute, larger models. Um, and what we see here is that uh, when these models even become good enough, the domain space of what they're good at and able to do starts to go combinatorial even larger. And here for these two points, I would like to uh, suggest two um, blog posts I highly recommend. One is uh, from Jacob Steinhardt called More is Different for AI. And this kind of links the phenomenon that we see in other fields like physics or biology, for example, uh, individual water molecules will be behave very differently and have very different, uh, let's say, electrostatic forces, then they start to clump up, clump up and start behaving as a liquid altogether. We see this in herds of animal and flocking patterns. We see this in humans and economies. We see this all across different fields and now even in AI. We see models that are doing stuff that would not be even possible where they at a smaller scale, but when they reach some critical scale in size, they start to work really, really well. This is documented by um, Jason in uh, his blog post, Emergence in LOMs, which you see this plot on the bottom left, success rate across a bunch of different tasks, whether it's modular arithmetic or Persian question answering, the success rate is basically flat until these models get big enough, good enough, and then these success rates just kind of skyrocket. And uh, that's why I think this, these are particularly um, exciting. So yeah, a question? I'm curious to know, do robotic foundation models display scaling Great question, and I'm really glad you asked. Uh, we have 
I, I'm pretty excited to present some directions we have along that. I hope we'll answer a question in maybe about 10 minutes or so. Okay. That's yeah. Cool. Um, but I think that's a question on all of our minds, including myself. Um, so I think before we even get to the feasibility or the existence of any robotics foundation models, like, is this even needed? And I think the argument that I don't think is obvious um, is that I think emerging capabilities and relying on these might be actually indispensable for robotics to actually work. A lot of the research over the past decades in robotics has been in one bin, one room, one table, one robot, one building even. But these are so vastly different from the orders of magnitude more complex while real world situations that humans operate in every single day. And I think to make that gigantic leap, we're going to have to rely on this emerging capability scaling curve where things kind of work. You have very canned demos. Maybe you have, you know, a humanoid robot program to backflip after hundreds of trials. But going from that to like the chaotic real world, I think we're going to have to rely on this emergence phenomenon for that. And I think maybe even intellectually or academically, it's also interesting to think about why or why not a foundation model for robotics might even work. It's worked in so many other domains. There's existence proofs in audio, music, coding, language, another domain every single day, it seems, with 3D models and, and beyond. Um, but if there is something very special about robotics, whether it's embodiment or causality or physical grounding, and that is the barrier to making this very simple recipe that's worked in all these other domains, if there is something special about robotics that causes this recipe to fail, I think that's quite interesting to study why that is. I'm personally an optimist. I don't think there is some magical secret sauce that's going to keep robotics from being tackled with the same um, formulas and recipes that's worked elsewhere. But, you know, I think this is a question I'd like to find out the answer to. And so maybe then instead of just motivating this philosophically, okay, we need foundation models. Foundation models are great. Let's try to build them for robotics. How do we actually do that? Well, um, I think we can leverage a few ingredients by standing on the shoulder of giants and looking at other domains. Uh, the first one is looking at different design principles of ML scaling um, from other domains. Uh, let's look first at high capacity architectures, the topic of this class today. Um, uh, ideas such as self-attention, as all the different ideas encompassed in the transformer, as Andre Karpathy famously said, it's like a magical universal differentiable computer that's very general, very robust, and very remarkably scalable on many different dimensions. Let's use those. Um, we should also leverage the more guiding principles that have been seen, the scaling laws, the trends, uh, this here is chinchilla. Uh, you know, we not only have to scale the model size, we also have to scale compute, and we also have to scale the number of unique tokens in the corpus of the vast data sets that we train on. But if we do all three together, uh, this has been shown to reliably have a pretty good chance of succeeding, um, no matter what domain you're looking at. And so, and, and finally, what that kind of means, and I think this is actually going to come up later, is that data set size seems to matter these days a lot more than quality. Even if you have some sentences on Wikipedia that are misspelled or some, some you know, falsehoods or some things that aren't so desirable, if in aggregate your data set is diverse enough and interesting enough, um, these things will hopefully wash out in the mix. Ingredient number two, the proliferation of the internet scale models themselves, not just the principles. What's exciting, and I'm sure it's you know definitely been very shocking for both experts and uh, lay people alike, is that a lot of these generative models across many different modalities have been experiencing emergent capabilities and have been surpassing all of our wildest expectations time and time and again. But even when we think that we're, we're exhausted, oh, this stuff is too much, it's not going to work, something will come out and completely blow me out of the water. And I think this trend will definitely keep continuing. And I think uh, in, in addition to that, they not only will continue coming on and accelerate more rapidly, they're going to happen with it, whether or not like we do anything, um, you know, in, in, in the grand scale of um, speaking. Me as a robotics researcher or, you know, you in, in whatever subfield you're on, there are parts of machine learning that likely you'll probably not ever touch in at least the, the near future. And those parts will be seeing tremendous breakthroughs and scaling and new capabilities coming online every single week. And uh, you, you can look at this not only in the impressiveness of the models, but also the acceleration of progress, the time scales in which new models are being released, why, where large collaborations are being worked on by many groups, and then you know, being available to access for all to use and build upon. And the final ingredient, and this trend is more of a robotic specific one, but it is a vast shift from online robotic learning where 
where robots collect experience online, make actions and learn through um, trial and error to an offline setting where we decouple the data generation process from the data consumption process. As we've seen in all these other foundation modeling domains, these big internet scale data sets are so diverse and they're static. We just scrape them once or scrape them multiple times continuously, but we aggregate a continuous pile that's just growing. Here we see either the pile data set from Eleuther or Lion 5B for uh, image paired image text. Um, and, and, and these are pretty big and they're orders of magnitude more than what we've seen before. And they are definitely a key ingredient to why other domains have been doing so well at training these big foundation models. And this coming back to robotics then, I'd like to take a brief detour into how the shift came to be because it's very easy to say in a sentence, yeah, robotics is offline more than online. And this is coming as kind of a no brainer to many folks who are coming from other domains, like this is the way things are done. But in robotics, this has been a very big shift. Um, and I think robotics has also been synonymous with RL, reinforcement learning for a lot of people. And I think increasingly this is becoming less true. And so I'd like to take you down a brief um, trip down uh, the history of my team. The slide at the top says brief history of robotics at Google. Um, and yeah, of course, thanks. Mm -hmm. And I think this is not just for dramatic exposition. It's really to try to guide you through how drastically our team's thinking has kind of evolved over the years and how that's going to inform the design decisions and the, and the kind of risks and research directions that we take um, in the specific projects that I'm going to show coming up. Thank you. Um, so in 2016, uh, some of you may have seen this, we had what we called the arm farm, seven KUKA robots in a room collecting picking data 24-7. And this was doing on policy RL in the real world. We were the first team to kind of say, hey, can we, can we even do this? Um, with the goal of saying, can we do end-to-end -end robot learning with results in the real world? This was kind of risky at the time. It was not a common take. And from that, we developed several interesting research directions that we started exploring. We looked into stuff like um, uh, QTOPT, which is a Q-learning method uh, working on continuous um, control actions uh, while look, taking uh, vision um, inputs. We worked on CycleGAN to transform simulation-based images into real-looking real images for sim to real. We looked at concurrent control of how we get robots moving faster and more efficiently in the real world. I'm sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, I was curious because you mentioned 24 7 data collection quantification. So, how did you reach that? Yeah, great question. And um, that one, I think, was basically uh, the arms would pick stuff up from the bin. If they messed up and it fell out, well, we'd come back the next morning and there'd be objects scattered all throughout the room. So there was no reset. But if they missed a little bit, the objects would fall back into the bin and hopefully be in a position where they could pick them up again. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Um, Chet, thanks, I'll do that in the future. Um, this specific question was for this 24 seven arm farm, how did we do resets? And the, the answer is, well, we didn't, we designed the bin so that they were kind of banked so that an object slightly missed, they would fall back in the bin reorient themselves, maybe add more diversity with the training data. But this was doing off policy online RL with Q learning. Um, and we mixed it with SIM data, deploy it again. Next, uh, we kind of went through this consolidation phase around 2020 when we're like, all right, this is pretty cool. And, you know, but we want to get out of the bin. How do we do more complex tasks in a more practical setting that could be closer to something that humans would want to use that's more general every day? There, we kind of settled on this office micro kitchen environment, if you've heard of the famous Google micro kitchens. Um, and I think uh, this was the setting we decided to, to operate in. Um, and there we started collecting data, we scaled our real operations, and there we kind of scaled approaches to some different things. And I think uh, in the bottom right here is like the more mechanized reset version, I would say, of, of the arm farm. Here we had a bin that folded in half, and this was doing multitask RL in the real world and the bin would flip in half, dumping objects from one side to the other. So you could do more interesting tasks, whereas the arm farm was pick anything up. Now we could say, hey, pick up the carrot and place the tomato onto the plate. And then the bin would flip and you'd reset. Some other works looked like at um, multitask imitation learning. This is DC0. And then we also looked at stuff like combining reinforcement learning with imitation learning bootstrapping. But in 2020, uh, once again, we realized we were working on a ton of different directions and we wanted to consolidate. And I think the two main things that were really uh, bothering us at the point at the time were we were hitting two main walls across all these methods. Some of them were plateauing at this 50 to 70% uh, you know, rough range in the real world. And other methods were requiring very specific data distributions. 
they had to be on policy or they could only use demonstrations or they blah, blah, blah. Like there were so many different nuances and, and like gotchas to all these different methods and all these different drawbacks. And so the question we posed was, we're open to any, any method, any strategy that will enable us to solve tasks in a very performant manner, more than 90% in the real world. And also that can scale with some kind of data that we can collect, you know, and, and maybe this is a, a bit more lax than let's say an academic setting where you're much more resource constrained. But at the end of the day, you know, even our team does not have infinite money. We still have a certain number of robots, a certain number of operators, and we're constrained by the laws of physics. So we need some way to acquire more data that we can then learn from. And so we're all scratching our heads, thinking about this for a few months in spring 2022. We decided on going with multitask imitation learning. So this was a vast departure from the 24-7 arm farm. This was a vast evolution of how we approached the problem. We found that, you know, with enough, you know, gentle care and love, multitask imitation learning was able to hit these 90% numbers, and it was able to get better with more demonstrations. These aren't the cheapest thing, but it was able to scale with additional demonstrations, which was the sign of life that we were looking for. So that brings us to less than a year ago, our team was deciding this is the path forward, at least in the near-term future, but um, maybe, you know, we could just think about how the approach we were taking here might also spread out in the future. And we might be able to bring back these other threads. Uh, for example, um, if now that we're decoupling this data collection of demonstrations or et cetera, from how we learn from them with a multitask imitation learning policy, maybe we can in the future then do something like offline RL. But I think at a high level now, I've just, you know, in, 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 a, in a few short minutes, just compressed six years of very bitter lessons that our team has been learning. And I think from where we are today and looking back, even just two years ago, if you told me that the strategies were deploying today could just scale the way they are, I probably would not have believed you. Um, no question. Great question. So I think task conditioning is definitely still was an open question at the time. Um, but I think with this work, uh, BC0, uh, we, we, we found that language was able, at least in a, in a, in a templated language um, kind of representation, was good enough where we could direct, I think BC0 is over 80 tasks. So they were, they were very templated, like pick grapes or like move grapes onto plate or drag this across, drag cloth across table. And I think um, this representation was still enough where you're learning a good number of skills. You're passing in essentially a one-hot ID into your policy network, and it will learn to imitate that. And for each one of those 80 tasks, we'd collect hundreds or thousands of demonstrations. So, and I will touch upon the specifics of that a bit later too. Um, so yeah, today, and or at least in 2022, let's do offline methods. Let's decouple data generation from data consumption. And let's take these three lessons now that we touched upon. Let's take the design principles of ML scaling and then figure out what lessons can actually be applied when we go look into the future for a recipe for uh, robot learning and foundation models. Um, the first lesson I think is very important is these high capacity architectures like attention. And the second I'll touch upon later is data interoperability, tokenization, tokenization discretization. Um, and the second ingredient is the proliferation of these models themselves can we leverage them because they will get better over time? Um, and I think here I would like to plug my colleague, Carol Hausman's Bitter Lesson 2.0, which is the bitter lesson. The first one from Richard Sutton was, you should leverage methods that scale with more compute. And maybe in today's day and age, the lesson is that we should leverage methods that are able to utilize improvements in foundation models because they're gonna get better. Yeah. So both in the Bitter Lesson 1.0 and 2.0, one thing that's always been clear to me is, suppose I have a set of methods and I want to choose the methods that are going to scale with more compute, or in this case, scale with better foundation models. The question is, how do I actually decide which of those methods meet those criteria? Yeah, great question. I think, um, and maybe it's, uh, and I think that's a very, I don't have a good answer sorry, for that. The question oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The question was, um, in Bitter Lesson 1.0 and Bitter Lesson 2.0, the question is, well, that's great. That's the lesson. But how do we actually decide which methods meet this criteria? And I think, you know, my answer is it, it, it's not always obvious and it's actually quite tricky sometimes, but uh, maybe, you know, sometimes, you know, what 
you can be very confident that, oh yeah, this will definitely scale um, with more data and compute and some that are same, but basically the more hard coded you are, the more assumptions, the more heuristics you bake in, the more you, in our, in our day and age, the more you rely on a specific implementation of a specific foundation model of a specific class of algorithm, maybe that will be less robust than a method that just assumes some very abstract input and output and assumes that how you get from that input and output can improve over time and maybe the algorithm itself even changes altogether. So I think that would be my take on the video lesson 2.0, but this is definitely still, uh, I think the jury's still out on this. And uh, my, my, my basic, um, my, my one of the things I like to propose is that language is the way that we can leverage video lesson 2.0. If you have language as the universal representation through which all these foundations communicate to each other, whether it's you know captioning or generation or whatnot, I think that's one way that we could leverage uh, video lesson 2.0. Um, and finally, the third ingredient, offline robot learning, decoupling data generation from data consumption. Putting these all together, my recipe for how one take at a modern attempt at embodied intelligence would look like would be to combine these large offline data sets with high capacity architectures by using language as the universal glue. And in the works I'm going to present shortly, all of our different projects, I think, in some way or another, are um, inspired by this philosophy. And now, now that we've kind of, um, you know, understood the motivations and pot potentially one possible approach. Wait, sorry, can you yeah. grab one slide? Of course. Uh, the bottom here, the recipe. Large diverse offline data sets, high capacity architectures using language as a universal tool. I'm curious to know which, of, if any of these are currently, bottlenecks not the right word, which of these are limited? Got it. Because it seems to me like we already have large offline data sets, we have high capacity architectures, and, you know, those architectures are relatively just using language. It seems like we already have all the components necessary. So why is this then not a solved problem? Um, the question was, uh, these. it seems like we have a lot of these ingredients. And so why hasn't robotics been solved yet? Um, so I would argue that actually this take here, and maybe I'm this is to the wrong audience at the moment, but I think this is not very non-obvious across the robotics field. Many people do not agree with all of these, much less two of these, or even any of these points. And so I think, uh, and also the existence of the scale of how mature each of these components are within robotics is at very different stages. And I would say like, and, and we can talk a bit later about like, for example, like data scale or the architectures that have kind of diffused through osmosis from other ML domains into robotics. But I think we're still at very different stages on how, how much people have actually bought into these lessons and invested in them. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Maybe about to get into this, sorry. Um, I'm curious to know, I'm not asking you to name names, but the people who might not be buying into all these pieces, why? Like, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I can probably, I, I also don't want to get into too much trouble here, yeah. but I, I'll, I'll, I'll probably get myself in a bit of hot water in a few slides. So okay. I, I'll, I'll expand upon it a bit then. Yeah. I'm just curious to know what their opinion is and why you think they're wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the ideas, huh? yeah. and, and I, I would say that like, me personally and um the, the you know not speaking for my team but a lot of people on my team are probably at the very extreme end of learning scaling data driven uh you know foundation model based uh let's go big um and i think a lot of people don't believe that and yeah happy to discuss why later yeah. maybe after the zoom as well so <laughs> um so yeah uh well okay then let's let's go ahead and dive in and see how this recipe might actually percolate into specific um domains um, and the first one is uh, RT1. Uh, this is a recent work from our group that works on how we can scale imitation learning. And let's look at how we can actually apply these first principles. So the first one is to consider what we actually, um, let's, let's put ourselves into the spring 2020 mindset. We, we've been collecting demonstrations for a while. This is a ton of demos, like 100,000 over that was collected over like a year and a half on many, many robots on many, many tasks. That exists, it was expensive. And over time, this will actually, you know, not trickle up at insane amounts. Like we won't just get 100,000 new high quality demos every day. This will grow over time, but it's not going to, you know, grow for free. Um, and autonomous ways of doing this is very hard, as you saw earlier with MTOP with the bin reset mechanism, or DeepMind has a work called RGB stacking, where they try to do autonomous resets. And, you know, what, the way that we're doing it right now, or at least um, for this paper, uh, was human teleoperation um, pioneered by BC0, and that was very expensive as well. So this is going to be limited throughput. And finally, uh, BC0 used a ResNet-based backbone, and it was pretty good, but it found that it was very sensitive to training distributions. 
For example, when they remove data from some teleoperators to make the data more homogenous, performance got better. And that's not really a property we like, right? We want more data, even if it's not exactly the same. Um, so the lesson here, models need to be robust and they need to generalize. Cool, so we have models need to be robust and generalized. What else do we have? Well, off the shelf models are pretty slow. If we take in these huge you know, vision transformers from other domains, they're not gonna run on the real robot. Uh, we need to be able to run at a pretty high frequency. Um, they need to be reactive. Inference time needs to be slow because all our models are vision-based. And finally, uh, we want our data to be able to understand language. As I mentioned, if language is the universal glue, our data set already has some language and we want eventual models to be very multimodal. This is a first principle that we need to bake in. What does this mean? We can't just take something existing. We probably need to design or at least modify something from the ground up. And let's take the best practices that we've seen work in other fields. And so we worked for a bit and uh, we came up with this architecture for RT1. Again, once again, this was a large team with a bunch of different contributions, and I'll just go through a few of them here. Um, at a high level, uh, RT1 is robotics transformer. Um, it operates at three hertz. It takes in a uh, visual input from the robot um, RGB camera, as well as a natural language instruction. There, the image is uh, patchified and fed into a film efficient net um, tokenizer. It's then passed into token learner, which I'll talk about soon. Um, and then also the language instructions are tokenized um, and then they are put into the same transformer. And then finally we output discretized um, actions as tokens and send that to the real world in three Hertz and closed loop. Um, this transformer is a decoder one. We use a sparse categorical entropy objective for action prediction uh, by applying a causal mask. Um, we use the pre-trained efficient net backbone and we also use token learner for, very fa for faster inference. Um, diving a little bit deeper. Oh, sorry. Yeah, a question. Great question. Um, so the image token, when it goes in from, so each image is the, you know, the high fidelity RGB image from the camera. We split that up into 81 separate patches. And so each patch is, you know, it's spatially just like the, the square there. Um, but the cool thing is that uh, what Token Learner does here, uh, this thing here, um, is it's a previous work from our group that takes in um, a bunch of possible um, uh, you know, uh, image patches and dynamically selects which of those image patch tokens are more relevant for the tax at hand given the existing context. So from those 81 image patch tokens, we subsample eight of them to use for inference. And this happens at every time step. Um, and that process is learned which of the eight patches are relevant at any given moment. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, we're, we're sending in way too many tokens and the context length would explode and we wouldn't be able to do inference on robots. We are also passing in a sequ sequence length of six images. Um, history is quite important when you're doing temporally uh, coherent tasks in the real world where things like physics and you know exactly this, this nuanced detail of what the objects are doing in relation to each other and to your robot, those details really matter. Um, and in total, the, the model size is 35 uh, million parameters, um, which is quite a bit smaller than a lot of these other, uh, you know, huge internet scale models. And um, finally, one main difference here is action discretization. Before, a lot of the products we were doing uh, were doing continuous control. And if you think about it, right, our robot does have, um, we do end effector pose control on uh, position control, and there, uh, the real world is a continuous state space. But, um, and, and, and to do that, we, we had to come up with many algorithmic novelties for example, a, a, a CEM actor that did basically sampling of these continuous action spaces to propose the highest ones that would get rated by the Q function. And we do this twice, blah, blah, blah. And, but that's like so sensitive, but we needed to get do that to get things to work. But now we just decided, let's just, uh, you know, bin our actions. It's only 256 discrete actions. And let's just predict those as tokens. Um, any questions? Yeah, what I was going to ask is, so here you mentioning that you have this design requirement or engineering requirement about speed, latency, or action time. And then you say that that necessitates having a relatively small model, which makes sense. But one of the lessons of scaling when we're talking about foundation models is that we don't need bottlenecks by either data, compute, or parameters. So I guess what I'm curious to know is how do you balance these off in the sense that you want to have lots of parameters to have a really powerful model, but on the other hand, you want to have very fast rainfall. Yeah, great question. And uh, to repeat it, the question is, um, 
we kind of set a pretty hard constraint with that 100 millisecond inference time, yet a lot of the lessons in foundation modeling is that you shouldn't be constraining yourself against any dimension, whether it's data set size, compute, or model capacity. And I think my initial answer to that is that's a very great point and something I think that's going to be coming up as a severe bottleneck um, in the future. Uh, but for, for our initial case, I think this is more of an exploration of whether these principles and even scaling well beyond what we were looking at now could work. Already, um, this 35 million is gigantic compared to a lot of prior work using, for example, uh, ResNet 34 or whatnot. So this is already much bigger than you know a lot of other options. And um, maybe for now, at least, it's the easiest, it's, it's the largest scale we could go to roughly um, in the short term without having to think of more tricks. Um, Got it, got it. Yeah, we can talk about it a bit later, maybe. I think I'd, I'd also love to hear your thoughts, too, because it's very non-obvious how we can get past um, some of these bottlenecks. Yeah. Any questions? So, one, you to me about is that, can I give you a magic computer with 100x compute, but everything else is the same as data, you can do 500 things. Do you think you see significant improvement, even some sort of emerging behavior with the current pipeline for just bigger models? Or do you think there's more to this than just like scaling up and you're like limited by the computer budget? Yeah, great question. Um, we ran some ablations on uh, model size. I, I, I might have that in a few slides, um, but uh, maybe we can return to that then. And if not, um, uh, I'll, 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 I can, uh, yeah, but great question. Um, so yeah, that, that that's the architecture and I'll discuss some of the ablations and the trends later on, but maybe, you know, this is a robotics lecture. Uh, I should show you some pretty visuals, right? Um, so let's look at some evaluations we did. Uh, we compared against some baselines. One is uh, Gato, um, which you might be familiar with. Um, and then other, the other one's BC0, the ResNet-based one. And we find that uh, we, we evaluate on seen tasks versus unseen tasks. And we also add in various distractor objects. Our normal data collect looks like this top left picture, three cans on a gray desk. That's basically it. But then we push it further by bringing in a lot more objects so that the table is so cluttered that even as a human, sometimes it's hard, it's hard to find the object that you're actually looking for. We add in table class to make the, the, the textures very different. We bring it to new micro kitchens um, with new surfaces altogether. And we find that RT1 is more robust than these other different methods. Um, so, yeah. I don't know if the data bridge is if you train this model on this data or was the data bridge also trained on this specific yeah. robot project? Good question. Uh question was um from the got uh, was the Gato model trained on our data or was it uh just already included in Gato? Oh uh, the answer is uh this data was not included in Gato, and so we retrained the Gato model only on our data. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so here's just a different visualization of the robot going out in our micro kitchen and doing different interesting things. Um, you can see here that it's trained on one setting, but then it goes into brand new kitchen, brand new countertops, new objects, and it's able to do all of them pretty robustly. Uh, we also put it into um, a long horizon setting um, using the SACAN framework that we'll talk about next. Um, but in these settings, uh, a lot of them are mixing all of these generalization capabilities. And on the plot on the left here, we're using what we call generalization levels inspired by the VEMA paper that would basically increasingly uh, change more factors of variation simultaneously. And here we found RT1 is the most robust. Yeah, good question. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail later, but I think at a high level, teleoperators get a structured templated command of like, verb, noun, verb, or something um, like, like pick, coke, can, or move, apple, near, sponge. Um, and they we, we have around 700 tasks set up this way, and they go ahead and collect that data, press done. And then later we have, um, we, we make sure that successes are actually successes, and we discard stuff that's like unsafe, for example. Yeah. Oh, yeah, got it. For this paper, we, we, we utilize 130,000 demonstrations for this. Yeah. Yeah, great question. I think a lot of prior work has also noted that um, when you have, for example, oh, the question was, did you find that the, the, the trajectories in your data set were very multimodal? And I think what you mean by that is that to go from point A to point, a to point B, I can go left or I can go right or I can go straight. Um, and I think this kind of diversity in basically for a single image state, but yet my data has three possible labels, 
that can have very bad effects sometimes. For us, I think because we are using teleoperative demonstrations, the data was more homogenous um, than perhaps like uh, in the wild, for example, there's a type of data collection called play data where operators just do whatever they want and we label it in hindsight. And I think our data is more homogenous than that, but we did not find a lot of the issues that we've seen in prior projects. One um, potential answer is maybe it's, it's, the, it's the architecture itself, but we can talk about that later too. Yeah, question. Uh, great question. Uh, we actually do have a termination action. So the the policy itself. So the question was, how do you determine when a episode is complete? And uh, the policy is able to predict terminate um, because at the end of each teleoperation session, the operator can click a button and it's marked as the episode's done. Yeah, I think for these evaluations, we were quite strict, um, but definitely, I think in some cases, uh, you know, maybe maybe if, if we're just doing an experiment for ourselves, we'll have a dense reward scale of like, grasp the object and move closer, grasp the object and almost got there, but messed up at the end, and we'll have like a, a grading curve, basically. But for all of these, all of these um, stats I'm showing here, it was zero or one, one fully complete, zero was not fully complete. Um, and I think what was exciting, exciting, maybe talking about the multimodality aspect, is then we pushed the limit even further. We were we decided to train on very diverse data distributions. Um, so your your math, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so right now you saw 130 to 1,000 demonstrations trained on this everyday robot, um, a proprietary um, mobile manipulator. But we were also looking to train on very different data distributions with very different, you know, action distributions, very different trajectories, even very different visuals, objects, tasks. And to do that, we included two other data sources. One was simulation data, which was kind of our robot, but in sim, but it looked quite different. And also this data was collected with reinforcement learning and not with teleoperative demonstrations. In the past, with all the IL plus RL work that I mentioned, we found that combining these, these two types of data was going to be very difficult because RL data has very short action. Um, it's very quick. It's very optimized for the specific reward function versus human collected teleoperation data is a lot more you know, human-like, so to speak. And finally, we revived the data set from many years ago in 2018. Um, if you remember the KUKA project, that arm farm has not been operational in that state for many years now, but we had that data still. And so we were hoping to see if a different robot with a different action space on different objects with different visuals in a different building could still be combined with data from this micro kitchen uh, um, uh, data set that we trained on originally. And what was very surprising to me is that RT1 was able to learn from all of these very diverse data distributions. I had never seen a result like this where any other architecture, for example, um, a ResNet or um, even another learning method like reinforcement learning could successfully learn on such different data distributions um, so robustly. And uh, we evaluated, for example, on combining concepts. So we would have the um, original everyday robot robot pick up objects that were only seen in the KUKA project or we would put objects only seen in simulation and see if our policy could understand that. So it did seem like it could generalize between objects that's seen in other data sets and concepts that had seen in other data sets into the setting it was in now in the real micro kitchen. And that was a very um, fun result. Yeah. I have a question. How did you combine the action spaces of the everyday robot with the Kuka? Great question. Um, yeah, we just tokenized it and make sure that the tokenization scheme was kind of interoperable. And I think that was the, um, uh, yeah, I, I can dive into that in a bit later too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and no, note that does not mean we can send the exact actions for one robot to another and have it execute. It was more just like in the data set, I think even by human inspection, you can tell that these are coming from two different robots. Um, so yeah, uh, let's look at some ablations for the scaling laws that we're all here for now. Um, we found that you know reducing data site, site size reduces performance, but more interesting maybe is task diversity was quite important. Here we have two different trends. Uh, um, the uh, green line is what happens when you reduce the total amount of episodes per task. And then gray um, here, the purple curve, is for what happens when you reduce the total number of tasks. And we found that having more tasks is relatively more important than having more data for each task. And I think this was a lesson that I think is probably going to suggest um, 
ways that you know we should scale robotics even further is not to just collect more data of the same task in the same settings, but to go out into the wild and get more diverse behavior. Quick question: How do you define diversity in the data? Great question. Uh, question is, how do you define data diversity? In this case, um, I, uh, it's just the number of unique structured templated commands that re re teleoperators receive. So those 700 templated commands, when we start reducing them and only train on 500 or only train on 300 of them, performance drops much quicker than if we had take, taken the same proportional uh, cuts to the total number. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess I'm curious to know if you get that. <clears throat> uh, it seems interesting that, like, uh, it seems almost like linear relationship as far as uh, the piece of data being um, characterized. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we, um, the question was, there seems to be almost a linear correlation between uh, data size and success rate. And I think, you know, we could apply some fancy, like, you know, scaling law, you know, trying curve fitting, but uh, we didn't look too much into that because, you know, this is a trend that we kind of expected. We just weren't sure about the, the magnitude of how much it would affect us. Um, and, uh, I think I don't have any really good insights on this besides that we see this phenomenon empirically. Yeah. Yeah, and, and great question. So, so the question is, oh, maybe this will just go on indefinitely, um, or is there something magical about you know January twenty twenty three? And I think this is maybe also a, a a this is when we start to conflate um the algorithmic exploration with like the practical considerations of scaling real world operations, which was when we got enough data, our policies were hitting you know saturating on these hitting close to one hundred percent. We were like, all right, let's connect collect another data set. So we basically collect until it's at one hundred, and then we switch to something else. Um, but at this point, what was interesting is that when we kind of bet really big on this RT1 architecture, we'd, are, we'd already been collecting demos for a while. So it was possible that we had collected more than we needed. And in some cases, actually, you could cut tasks without losing too much performance, which was quite interesting. But Multiple yeah. I mean, yeah. like if you just use like the same object for all the tasks, uh, or like same visual field, like they're like feeling. I know we thought there was a correlation, but it's just like a feeling. Yeah, yeah. How much it's Great question. And the question is whether or not all tasks are created equal in terms of like their capacity and entropy for different behaviors you could learn from them. And yeah, that's definitely true. Some tasks are much easier. Pick, uh, we have a task that's just pick up this object. It's going to have much less interesting stuff you can squeeze out of it than, you know, moving something into a drawer and then closing the drawer. Um, but yeah, great question. Um, great. Now, um, ablations, uh, we also trained without the big model size. We did it without pre-training, without, uh, you know, with continuous instead of discrete actions, with, with uh, autoregressive actions, without history, without the transformer. Uh, and I think all of these design choices did seem to be required for robust performance. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah I, I think all, of, I mean, like, and, and again, you know, for, for paper writing, it's kind of like the best thing that we can empirically find, that's, that's the method, and then we'll figure out why each of these are important. And so, uh, yeah, I think what one surprising thing here, perhaps, was that autoregressive actions hurt. You might think that passing in more information is always better than passing in fewer action, uh, fewer information. But in this case, uh, maybe conditioning on your previous actions was kind of doing kind of like in-context learning. It was doing online systems identification to figure out what teleoperator this data came from and like how you can overfit to that specific set of action history. And so removing that was actually better. Um, one interesting tidbit there. Um, cool then. And uh, maybe in the interest of time, uh, I'll try to get through the other ones uh, a bit more quicker and then we can maybe just do fewer, uh, we'll, I'll just uh, do the questions at the end if that's possible, um, just so we have time to get through everything. Um, the next work here, moving a bit away from skill learning then and actually onto the planning level. I think the first project took a lot of the design principles of other fields um, and uh, this offline robot learning paradigm and put it into the, the skill learning. Can we actually bring that out to other parts of the robotic system? 
And the first work here is SACAN. If you remember here back in this timeline in 2022, we started thinking about, oh yeah, how do we scale um, this uh, multitask imitation learning? But at the same time, large language models and you know other types of foundation models were really picking up steam, whether it was Imogen or Dolly 2. Um, and we definitely wanted to figure out how we could use those as well. We had come up with this RTU21 design that we're betting big on, but um, from here we started to explore how all of the, the beta lesson 2.0, we could start utilizing foundation models within the context of our full stack system. The problem of doing this naively is that language models are not completely a very natural fit for robotics. For example, um, if you're a robot in a kitchen, you ask a language model, I spill my drink, what can you do? Language model will give you stuff that's not very relevant. It's going to ask you to vacuum it. It's going to ask you to call cleaner or it's going to apologize. And these are not things that the robot can do in your kitchen with your spilled drink to help you. And so there are two parts of this then. Uh, the one issue is that our robots are limited. They are very constrained with what they can do. They cannot do everything, but they can do certain things. And then the second problem is that um, the language models are also constrained. They don't know what the robot sees. They don't understand that they are in a robot body, in a micro kitchen, needing to do real stuff in the physical world. And so we need to get the robots to speak language model language, and then the language model to, see, to speak robot language. Um, to do this, we present SACAN. Uh, in the same setting, you know, please put an apple on the table. Uh, we score um, the predictions of the language model on a constrained set of tasks that we know the robot um, has been trained to do. And then we also take the affordance function from the robot. An affordance function is a estimation of given some kind of state, uh, what the robot is able to do, um, how confident it is that it can successfully accomplish that task in the given state. In our case, we use something like a value function from reinforcement learning, which kind of encompasses this quality. Given these two values, these two scores, we have the confidence from the language model and then the confidence from the robot. We can combine these and then hopefully the combined prediction is both something that's going to be very semantically relevant for the high level instruction. Finding an apple is the first step in please put an apple on the table, but it's also something that the robot can do. There's no robot in the frame, but it knows that it's been trained to find an apple so it can navigate around to find it. And so hopefully we can do this then in closed loop and then uh, keep on going and predicting a high level plan from the language model that's grounded with the affordance function of what the robot understands. Um, there's a video here of the uh, Sekian doing different stuff, but you know, happy to share it later um, offline. Uh, it's very cool, trust me. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, um, and yeah, some numbers then. Uh, we tested this out on very long horizon instructions encompassing more than 10 separate navigation and manipulation skills in the micro kitchen that you see on the bottom right. Um, we uh, evaluated um, hundreds of different evaluations on this, and we tested out very um, a lot of different concepts, including things like rephrasing by using single primitives, by drawing um, instructions that just came from uh, you know colleagues and friends. Uh, and then we and we found that uh, while there were failures in both the language model planning stuff side, where it would predict the wrong task for the current situation, uh, as well as on the policy execution side, even when it gets a good plan, the robot will mess up sometimes. Overall, it was still doing quite well. Um, and now let's kind of take this back to the lesson. Uh, I, I think this is a very great example of how we can leverage um, internet uh, internet scale foundation models as they get better. When we started the project, we started with a language model called Flan from Google. Um, throughout our implementation, uh, Palm came online, Pathways Language Model. And when that happened, we were able to just hot swap it in and uh, performance just kind of got better for free without us having to do anything. By just assuming that language was the API, the plan just has to be any string. It can come from any source. It can come from a human. It can come from a language model. When we improve that language model, the system gets better overall. Um, and here you see with the scaling size as, as the model LOM increased in size, our planning performance got even better. Um, and some cool tricks here to get it working. Well, uh, how do we actually produce this plan? Well, just by prompting um, as is the ridge these days uh, with chain of thought um, and with better prompting of just giving it examples of here are some great robot plans. Now, give me a new plan starting with this high level instruction. Uh, we saw that the robot could do all things from uh, understanding different languages to uh, 
asking asking them to do very complex reasoning like hey give me something caffeinated or i don't do caffeine anymore get me something like you know better um or i, I could bring me a healthy stack versus bring me a unhealthy stack so Ken was able to link uh reason through all of these but uh you know i think that was our kind of the first contact of robotics with language models on our team and it was the first exploration into how these two worlds could overlap um, there was definitely still improvements. So in, in our monologue, we try to improve those further by bringing in vision language models. The idea here is that, uh, you know, we had very high plan rate success uh, with uh, SACAN, but unfortunately, it wasn't really able to recover from failures. What I mean by that is that the language model would not really get updates of what was going on in the world. So that if this was the plan it proposed, go to the table, pick up a Coke, bring it to you, but you messed up picking the Coke can, you dropped it on the floor, it would still continue trying to bring it to you, put it aside, but all of that does not really matter anymore because you dropped the Coke can. And so in this work, um, in our monologue, uh, we were really hoping to figure out how we could add, add closed loop dynamic feedback from the environment into this planning process. Let's take that exact same example. Um, now, instead of just directly correcting every instruction, maybe we add back some feedback from the scene, also conveyed using language as the universal API here. Uh, the scene can tell you what's actually in there. Maybe uh, the robot asks a question now in the robot. This is the language model asking the clarification question. Maybe hear a human response or another language model. Then you can predict the action, uh, the next task to do once the language model has enough context. And maybe you even add in stuff like success detection um, and so on and so forth. How do we do this then? Well, um, the first thing that we implement is what we call passive scene description. Just using either an off-the-shelf engineered heuristic, using object detection models, something like Viled, uh, you can describe the scene in text and just convey all of that context to the language model. For active scene description, this is maybe similar to visual question answering, if you're familiar with that field. Uh, uh, the, the language model can actually propose active queries that it's curious about in the scene, maybe to make sure that it has enough context to move on. Um, and here, Either a human can provide the answer, or in the future, a VQA model, um, as they improve, can provide that. And finally, for success detection, uh, this is very important uh, to allow the language model planner to know when to try to retry something. Um, here we take in the first and last image, uh, fine tune a clip success detector, and use that to provide uh, binary success failure information back to our language model. Um, and for the results wise, uh, we can see a very similar SACAN long horizon evaluation, but here we actually, what's interesting um, is that we're able to and, and basically implement all these different automated feedback mechanisms on the robot. And so that it's able to reason and recover from things. Here you see it's going to try to um, go to the table, um, but uh, the humans actually been saying, hey, I changed my mind. Uh, and then it changes, the human changes mind again, asking it to go back and forth. And the robot's able to, you know, maybe we're kind of torturing the language model at this point, but uh, the language model's able to replan and, you know, make sure that the human intent is satisfied. Um, we also tried, I'm not sure if this video shows it, uh, but situations where we did adversarial inputs, where I walked around and just kind of uh, knocking objects out of the robot's hands and um, forcing the success detector to tell it, hey, you, you messed up, you know, try again. Um, and uh, we also tried this out on a couple of different domains, a simulated tabletop manipulation domain, as well as a real world manipulation domain. And we found that this was uh, much better than SACAN, or let's say just only using um, visual features themselves with something like Clipboard. And I think here, uh, it really speaks towards um, a, a trend that I've really come to appreciate. Uh, in 2018, a robotics professor once said that when they looked at all the different things preventing robot learning from scaling tremendously, they thought the bottleneck was high level semantic planning about reasoning, about common sense. And I think in 2022 and 2023, language models can provide a one path of how this can kind of be offloaded, um, at least in the interim. And I think if language models are the API, then you can just bring in these vision language models as object detectors get better, as success detectors, as VQA, as language models get better, you can bring them all into the fold and they act as kind of a life vest. If your robot currently does not have common sense reasoning, uh, these other models can act as a scaffold and a life vest to bring you up to par with what they currently know. And maybe then in the future, you'll get beyond what the language models know, but in the short term, it does seem that we can leverage them to accelerate what we can do in the real world. 
Um, moving on now from, we saw now how language models could do planning. We saw how vision language models could help planning. And now we're going to switch gears a bit and think about how vision language models can help other aspects of the bottlenecks that robot learning faces. Um, one of these is that uh, data collection is very expensive. As we mentioned before, we did have this 130,000 episode demonstration data set, um, but it was collected over a year and a half at significant cost, um, both in resources, in time, in money, um, and uh, with many, many robots. And of course, these tasks too were also a bit limited, right? We used 700 very templated commands, instructions that we would give to teleoperators because we knew that this was this would scale, right? If we collected enough data for each of these templated tasks, we could do that specific task. Um, and here's the, the flow that someone was asking about earlier. We give this pick token instruction. The operator controls the robot in the real world, finishes the task, marks the episode as terminate, and then uh, you know shade that out to this big orange data set. And that big orange data set is what we trained on in all of the previous projects for the control policies. What we additionally considered was adding a bit of crowdsource hindsight annotation. If you're familiar with it, with a hindsight experience replay um, in reinforcement learning with goal conditioning, uh, with you know maybe the robot did something that wasn't just this high level templated instruction. We could ask a human to describe more ver verbosely what the robot did. Maybe it picked up the coke can that was on the right side of the table. Maybe it picked it up and then knocked it over. Maybe it moved it very slowly to the middle. There's a lot of semantic diversity encompassed in this uh, demonstration that was that is not totally you know, uh, caught by this high level templated pick coke can instruction. So we labeled 3% um, of this big orange data set with these very verbose descriptions. Um, and next, we uh, kind of applied the pseudo label strategy, a strategy that's been seen in other fields, uh, such as video pre training with their inverse dynamics model. But instead, we apply that to the instructions, to the semantics of what's contained in your data set. So, step one, we pre train a clip model um, on your uh, small label data set of 3% of your main data. Then you go ahead and use that trained BLM data to label all of the templated instruction demonstrations that you had before that 130,000 episode data sets. Now you have a relabeled data set, which has a large diversity of interesting semantic instructions. Um, and then we plug in all of these uh, data sets into RT1 and just train a language condition behavior cloning policy, similarly to how we would uh, normally, but even though normally we just use data set B, the orange one, now we use all three data sets. And then finally, we evaluate on entirely new unseen instructions. Um, in the prior works, right, we were evaluating mainly on the 700 uh, templated instructions, but in this work, we actually go beyond that. We can type in, you know, almost anything you want that you think might succeed, and uh, you can phrase it how you can. You can add typos. You can uh, even do it um, by referring to semantic concepts. You can add spatial concepts, and we see how it does. Um, the reason that this might work, uh, maybe visually to, to represent this, is here are the TSNI embeddings. Um, on the left and the right. It's the same embeddings, but on the left, they're colored by the original templated instruction that was used to collect that episode. And on the right is what the vision language model thinks um, if it's allowed to put a free form natural language caption and assign it to that episode. You see that on the left, you have these big clusters of pick cocan is like, you know, hundreds or thousands of episodes, but we all just call them pick cocan. But on the right, then we can then expand those concepts and say, actually, this episode is picking up the red cocan. This, this episode is picking up the crumpled cocan. This is picking up the cocan that's next to the chip bag. And so you can get a lot more mileage out of the same underlying data set by just using language as the diversity mechanism through which you kind of expand the concepts that you're considering. And for example, in the middle, you see um, you know, open top drawer can become hold and pull out the top drawer. We have stuff like uh, the center left for the middle um, for the middle episode. For the bottom one, pick green rice chips from white bowl becomes lift up the green chip bag from the bowl and drop it at the bottom left corner of the table. So you get a lot of these semantic, um, you know, spatial concepts that are now going to be in your target supervised labels. I have a question. So using language as a diversity injection here for um, that kind of reminds me of like, this is especially for um, like where language is just being, you have your capacity uh, model for you have your original uh, you know, uh, systemic uh, system, and then you have a lot of these stuff that are distributed by the situation. Um, what are the whole reason that? What's the key benefit of the problem? Yeah. Um... 
Great question. So I I, I guess uh, if, if I can rephrase a bit, um, the problem is that like it, it's actually a very um difficult and uh, perhaps even untractable problem of how you map all the linguistic concepts you see out in the wild down to like maybe like embodied specific uh, types of episodes and like. Here, maybe I would say is that we are definitely introducing a lot of our priors and our biases onto like maybe what we call as left, you mean left 10 centimeters, left two centimeters, like the, the, like what do words mean and these definitions, what do they mean to us, to the crowd compute raters that generated these captions, what do they mean to the robot, what do they mean to the language models, maybe these are all slightly different, but the hope is at least if they're roughly similar, will get like directionally correct improvements. So I, I would say the nuances of the specific hard lines of definitions and like actual, like, you know, semantic meaning of these words, I think that's maybe out of scope right now, but maybe something we'll dive into further. At a higher level though, I think basically the bar is just so low. We have these 700 templated instructions that are basically one hot IDs. And we just wanna make those closer to natural language, um, even if by a little. Um, and I think at least, we're, we're, we're trying to get towards that with these vision language models that are capturing automatically. Um, hope that answers your question. Yeah. And uh, we also compare it to a few baselines. Um, on the top left here, we look at what if we only train on this 3% of the, these fancy human rated labels? What if we only train on the original RT1 data sets? What if we train on both of these? And what if we train on both of these plus all of the predictions given by our BLM? And what's interesting here is that, uh, you know, relabeling seems to universally help. Uh, we, we evaluated only on novel instructions. That was new for this project. It's the first time on a robotics project where we only tested on sentence. I could type whatever I thought. I would type it in, and that became the, the test set. And we just had to make sure that it was never contained in the, 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 the training coverage. Um, and you see all these interesting examples on the right here of stuff like move the lonely object to the others. I, I have no idea how this worked. Um, stuff like, you know, just lifting the yellow rectangle, talking about colors, talking about move the right apple to the left. Here we actually had two apples in the scene. And actually in our training demonstration data, we never collected um, scenes with duplicate objects just because, you know, we thought of this multimodality problem. If you just say pick Coke can and there's two Coke cans, it's going to be very difficult to figure out which one to do. But with language labeling, it seems like maybe we could do that now. So even though we never trained on scenes with two apples, now you can evaluate on them and just specify with language which apple you want to go for, and it was working pretty reasonably. Um, and finally, for the last example here, I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, a single cocan, we try to do a novel behavior. Uh, push towards the left was not a templated instruction. We only had move cocan near Y, where Y is another object. Move cocan near apple, move cocan near sponge. So pushing this motion of just pushing the, the, the cocan into air essentially was not something that we ever encompassed, but maybe it was in one of the labels. Maybe like if you've seen like move cocan near apple and the apple's on the left and you saw move cocan near sponge and the sponge is on the left, you would general, the model can generalize and be like, oh, left means this side of the table, not a specific object. Um, so maybe that's what's happening, but it's very unclear. This is, as I said, uh, you know, just I, I type, I thought of something, I typed it and just saw what happened. Uh, and we definitely hope to explore this more quantitatively in the future. Um, bottom left course is I think comparing against non-visual augmentation. So maybe you can also get these interesting concepts just from language alone, right? Here we had adding random noise or we do Madlib style, just swapping out words, or we even use a LOM, GPT-3 in this case, to propose rephrasings of existing instructions. But I think my takeaway there is that you really need visual grounding for the visual language model to say, actually, yeah, this caption is factually accurate at this given point in time, and that it's you know something perhaps that um, would be interesting for a robot. That fine tuning process provides both of those. Yep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, th these are just some subsets of five of these evaluation instructions, but we had over 60 of them. Uh, we didn't do a full quantitative ablation, for example, as we did um, in RT1, we had this like seen and unseen task set, and that was compositional. You'd see, you know, move Coke near Apple, and you would see move Apple near Sponge, but we'd hold out, move Coke near Sponge, and we, we'd test that out. But in this case, I think we can go much more beyond that because our language is completely freeform. The compositional space of what you can kind of combine is just going to be much larger. So we did try a little bit to answer your question. 
we tried some combinatorial evaluations, but there's definitely a, a lot more thoroughness that we could do there too. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, 10 minutes. Um, maybe I'll try to wrap up pretty soon then. Uh, the dial of takeaway then is that um, two parts, right? Lesson two, leverage foundation models. Let's use them as data augmentation. And lesson three, let's make sure that our offline data set, you know, is robust enough where these different behaviors exist and you can describe them in language. If you don't have enough diverse behaviors, no matter how good your labeling is, you probably can't elicit all the interesting concepts that you want to learn from. Um, and maybe most exciting for me here was that actually some label noise is okay. Notoriously in supervised learning and imitation learning, you need very clean labels that are always 100% true, right? You don't want to be learning from like noisy data where some like, you know, large percentage is just not accurate. But in our case, um, it seems that like some label noise was okay. The vision language models was not always uh, predicting factually accurate descriptions of the scene. Um, and I think this definitely hurt um, when it got too high, the noise, but at smaller levels, it definitely still seemed uh, to be okay and robust enough to handle that. So that was a deep dive then on some individual works that use this big recipe of language, foundation models, offline data sets in different parts of the robot system. And this was the kind of pitch at the beginning. And I hope uh, you at least see a little bit of how our team has tried to take these principles and apply them to accelerating robot learning in the real world. Um, as we see these different types of ingredients and lessons map onto different parts of the robot system altogether. For skill learning, right, that was RT1 that we talked about. For planning, that was SACAN and then adding the close of feedback with vision language models, that was inner monologue. For low level control, we didn't talk about this today, but an exciting work from our team is actually using language models to predict code that's executed on the robot directly, perhaps as low-level controllers. Um, language models, you know, they read textbooks, they've read, they've read raw stocks, they've read, uh, you know, UR5 documentation code, and they can write code for these robots, and we can execute that. Um, for data augmentation, we saw Dial um, with vision language models. Uh, and also, um, I didn't talk about this here, but for object-centric representations, for things like feature activation map for spe specific objects, we can use those as task representation um, for mapping a scene. And in NLMAP, they did that uh, for object-centric nav object navigation um, around the micro kitchen that we looked at. Um, and I think hopefully in the next you know, coming weeks and months, uh, we have a few more rows and entries to add here as well. Um, but I think uh, this kind of mindset is a very exciting research direction of how you can apply these big high-level concepts about foundation models and offline data sets. And you look at what exists in the robot systems of today, and you find many gaps and opportunities still available where we can um, do everything from exploratory pilots on how this might look like, all the way to more extensive evaluations and really building out robust systems. I think both of these have value. So. I'll, I'll uh, conclude with just saying that uh, it was very fun exploring all of these complementary directions, but there are still some major questions of how we can take these concepts even further and how these trends and ideas might even evolve moving forward as foundation models get better, as more data set becomes available online, as more data becomes homogenized and tokenized and interoperable. And I think a lot of the concepts from other fields like uh, linguistics and vision and from, you know, uh, all of the uh, big scaling kind of level questions that are being pioneered um, in language-based foundation models. Hopefully those kind of ideas can trickle down to robotics. Maybe even robotics can provide something back by providing embodied action causal data sets that maybe might improve the quality of reasoning of some of these large language models that are not embodied. Um, with that though, I guess I'd like to, um, you know, uh, thank everyone for your time and for uh, Dave and Sia for inviting me and uh, open to any questions about the papers or just at a high level as well. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, great question. So the question, I guess, is like, uh, what about tasks that require more semantic reasoning, like, uh, you know, operating at a certain speed or with maybe like, I don't know, numerical reasoning within the question, the prompt itself? Um, I would say, um, so for a lot of the more common sense reasoning, like, you know, uh, 
throw away three co-cans uh, you know, after another, I think um, you know, the language model is very good at that right now. So for the SACAN planner, it will predict, you know, throw away the co-can three separate times. Um, for the low-level skill policy learning, though, I think um, that's more of a, that's more high variance, I would say. Um, and definitely for right now, we don't really um, condition on speed or how you do it exactly. Um, but that's definitely maybe something that Val could do if, if you could relabel with like pick up the co can slowly versus pick up the co can quickly. Maybe that is something a vision language model could recognize. Yeah. Good question. Uh, the question was, at what scale um, do we see like combinatorial generalization start to occur? Uh, maybe between like you've seen colors of one block and then you want to evaluate on a, on a new color. Um, and I, I think that's a great question. And unfortunately, my, my answer is going to be very vague. And it depends. It depends on how you define your tasks. It depends on the scale of your data set. And it depends on like the concepts that you're trying to generalize across. I think um, there have been uh, numerous attempts to kind of basically uh, formalize what it means to generalize within uh, you know, learning and within robotics, even within like the specific settings we consider. And I don't think there are any clear trends be, like of where you can say, oh yeah, this is the number I need to hit where, you know, I can generalize across X, Y, Z dimensions. Um, like you could evaluate all of those, but I don't think it will help you predict new trends, at least right now. I think we're probably, you know, this is just me talking. I would say we're one order of magnitude off before we can start to make very broadly generalizing statements about generalization capabilities. Uh, I think, you know, add, add one or two more zeros to our data set size, and we can start to talk about that um, in terms of task object skills. Yeah. Yeah, very astute observation. Um, so the question, uh, the, the question was that in SACAN, uh, the value functions that predict these uh, scalars on the right here for the affordances um, are only storing a certain limited number of tasks. So is that the bottleneck? And I would say yes, 100%. Scaling the number of tasks that your system is able to do that you can then give to the planner as its buffet of options to choose, that is the bottleneck, right? No matter how good your planner is, if you can only do like three tasks, there's only certain like combinations of those three tasks that it can do to you know map onto a high level instruction. So as you add more tasks, as the low level skill capabilities of your robot increases, uh, you're kind of like adding precision to like the the um, coverage of the high level instructions that your robot can try to do. Um, so that's a, a that's one of the main bottlenecks I see today. Great question. Um, so have we tried RT1 with RLHF or with RL? Um, I think the short answer is I think we have some stuff in the works that is doing that. But right now, for all of our um, projects currently, we're just using this implementation learning loss. Um, again, I think I, I view this multitasking implementation bet that we're making as kind of an existence proof. It works. It's not cheap but it kind of does work and it does scale. And that at least is a good starting point. And our main you know, hope over the next months and years is can we improve beyond that? Can we add back in offline improvement? You know, Can we add in RL back to the equation somehow? I'm an RL person at heart, so I really hope so. Sorry, could you repeat that? Got it. Okay. 
Yeah, good question. I, I, um, so I, I, regarding task balance and whether like text only data is sufficient for helping like motor control learning, um, I think uh, my hope is that when you know model go, models when we experience emergence in both the robotic space and we've already seen emergence in the language space, at some point maybe these reasoning concepts will start to transfer between the two. I would point them to one interesting um, paper, uh, which is I think can Wikipedia help reinforcement learning um, from um, Shane and some other uh, folks. They pre-train, uh, you know, a large policy network on like, you know, autoregressive token prediction on Wikipedia, just text only. And they use that to initialize like control for Atari games uh, with RL. And this actually helped. So, you know, maybe this is philosophical, but maybe there's something about decision-making reasoning that transfers between text and action data. So. Great question. Um, I, I definitely agree. Uh, you know, passing in six images is not going to be enough when you're executing tasks for minutes at a time. Like clean my whole house, and then you can only pass in the last like you know two seconds. Like come on. Um, so I, I think that's definitely going to be a limitation as our tasks get more complex and long horizon. Um, and I think here it's another open question too. Uh, is context length. We have high dimensional images, even with token learning for, for reducing the number of patches that we pass through, it's still you know, very high dimensional and we quickly hit the context length cap. Can we do, how do we you know, improve it beyond this? Maybe it's like retrieval transformers or some other kind of mechanism. Great question. I think um, we are hoping to explore that in the future, but with this like context length limitation, we are already near the context length capacity with just these six images alone, much less uh, you know passing in whole trajectories of zero shot behavior, few shot behavior we wish to see. Um, so to be the yeah. Cool. Thank you guys.